Hi, I'm Melissa Cobb, Come Fly with AOPA. This week we talk about proper real estate planning around airports, share some tips for safe ground handling operations, and learn lessons from a fatal high density altitude accident with the AOPA Air Safety Institute's newest accident case study. AOPA keeps flying safe, accessible, and fun by protecting your freedom to fly. We are the most trusted one-stop resource for all things related to general aviation. Become an AOPA pilot today. Well, in case you're wondering, this airplane behind me is my dad's. I know it's the second week uh, that it's been here, but he needed to have a little bit of maintenance done. And so uh, we just swapped airplanes for a little bit. All right. Well, uh, this week, AOPA video editor, pilot, and Cessna 140 owner Michelle Walker gives us some tips on how to safely handle aircraft on the ground. And really, aircraft ground handling is a vital uh, safety operation before and after every single flight. First and foremost, always check with the pilot or owner before helping someone move their airplane. It's always best to ask them first where would be the best spot on the airplane to push or pull. Or if it's a new to you airplane, check the POH and see if it has any guidance on where to move the airplane. Before moving an airplane, always visually inspect it to make sure that moving the airplane wouldn't cause any additional damage, such as checking that there's adequate tire pressure. When at all possible, use a tow bar to move an airplane. Propellers are pretty strong, but if you push on them frequently enough, especially improperly, it could lead to some long-term damage. And if you're gonna push on a propeller, there's also always the chance that if you moved it enough, if the mags were not wired correctly, or there's something wrong with the switch, the engine could start or at least kick back. Always use the right tow bar or tug. Using the wrong tow bar or makeshift equipment could lead to damage of the airplane. Never leave the tow bar attached to the airplane and walk away. You could forget it, start up the engine, and then damage the propeller and the tow bar. If you have to push the airplane by the prop, never push by the tips. Always pull as close to the hub as possible. There's a greater risk for damage when your hand is farther from the hub. The blades could bend, the bearings could loosen, and you may need to replace the entire hub earlier than you should. Before going near the propeller, confirm that the mags are off and ensure that the mixture is at idle cutoff, if equipped. Be mindful of rings or other jewelry on your hands that might scratch or damage the prop and never push on the spinner. Be careful when pushing an airplane. The repetitive motion of pushing and pulling such weight in an awkward body stance could create an injury or build up a repetitive stress injury. When moving a small airplane, you often have limited visibility, especially when moving it into a small space like a hangar. So if at all possible, get a second person on the wingtips to make sure that you have adequate clearance while you're moving the airplane. If it's your hangar and airplane, consider taping down the points on the ground so that you know where you can move the airplane to have the right amount of clearance. If you have to move an airplane without a tow bar and you wanna give someone a hand, the best places to push on the body of the airplane are as close to a joint as possible, such as down the bottom of a strut close to the fuselage. That's where the aircraft's gonna be the strongest and gonna be able to take that amount of force. You can use a tow bar with a tailwheel airplane too, but if you don't have a tailwheel tow bar, you can usually push on the vertical stabilizer or leading edge of the horizontal stabilizer as close to the fuselage as possible. Or if it's a light enough tailwheel airplane, you can just pick the tail up to make it easier to move. Keep in mind the terrain you're trying to move the airplane on. Is there a slope? Is the grass slippery? Are there potholes you need to avoid? Just be mindful of these things while you're moving the airplane. And remember when you're parking the airplane outside, always point it into the wind. Before walking away from the airplane, make sure there are chocks in, secure the control surfaces, and that the master is off. I hope these tips were helpful, and keep in mind, before you move an airplane, always refer to the manufacturer's guidance or the POH if possible. What are your other aircraft moving tips? Let us know in the comments below. Thanks, Michelle. Great tips. All too often, airports are being threatened across the country because of poor real estate planning around the airport. They're facing things such as incompatible land use, noise complaints from nearby residents, and even runway protection zone encroachment. AOPA works every day at the national, state, and local levels to encourage airport sponsors to include compatible land use planning um, early on in the process when they're working through airport zoning and airport development processes. And when they do this, it really sets up a win-win for the airport, for the tenants at the airport, and for the surrounding community. 
I've asked AOPA Vice President of Airports and State Advocacy, Mike Ginter, to join us and share the problems that he's seeing airports face across the country. Hey, Mike, thanks for joining us. So can you give us a high level of, you know, the problems that you're seeing because of incompatible land use? I sure can, Alyssa. Thanks for having me today. Uh, incompatible land use is uh, basically defined as as development near airports that the FAA has determined not to be compatible with the airport. Uh, and uh, most pilots will recognize that as large residential developments being built under the turn to base leg or under the turn to final or cell phone towers being built, you know, 300 feet abeam the runway or all manner of examples like that. And uh, that's an issue AOPA has been uh, watching carefully for many, many decades. And just since uh, 2020, we've dealt with over 550 airport issues, many of which deal specifically with airport development and more specifically with incompatible land use development. So it's a very serious issue. We, we try to help airports in order to protect pilots. Okay, and when we, when we get it right and the, the compatible land use is you know, baked right in there with the plans for the airport, what does that look like? We ask airport managers and city planners to consider the airport in their strategic planning at the county and city level. Make sure the airport's factored into strategic growth plans so that the airport can become a magnet for growth rather than a speed bump to growth. When the airport is considered as part of a master development plan at the city or county level, then we see the proper zoning being placed around airports that might be light industrial or things that the FAA would consider are compatible. Okay. Now, if, you know, pilots who are watching, they're worried about the, the land use around their airport and threats that they may be facing, how can they reach out for help? Great question. So uh, we are certainly uh, a resource for pilots. Uh, what pilots can do is, number one, stay aware of what's going on around their airport, which means take a look at the county uh, board minutes or the city council minutes uh, or their meeting agenda and pay attention to zoning, proposed zoning changes. Uh, and if that pops up on the agenda, then we would ask the members uh, to either contact our local airport support network volunteer or contact our regional managers directly at AOPA's 800 number. We have uh, played this uh, uh, strategy many times. It's always specific to the airport, but we know how to help. Uh, we'd prefer to help on the early side of the process rather than two days before the city is going to take a vote on it. But getting the information to us is the number one thing pilots can do. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Well, we appreciate everyone, everything that you're doing and everyone on your team to help protect airports around the country. It's a worthwhile fight. Thank you, Alyssa. Mm -hmm. AOPA and several general aviation organizations have joined together and recently weighed in on a special federal aviation regulation proposal to uh, really pave the way for introducing advanced air mobility aircraft into the U.S. airspace system. So manufacturing projections uh, in the eVTOL industry estimate that certification and commercial operations for advanced air mobility aircraft could actually start as early as 2025. The groups commented on things like certification, training, qualification requirements, as well as requirements for operating powered lift aircraft. Then they also detailed requirements for maintenance and alteration and made recommendations even for flight simulation training devices and new training technologies. So the groups have encouraged the FAA to consider aligning this special regulation more closely with ICAO standards, and that is all part of an effort to keep the U.S. at the forefront of the advanced aircraft mobility movement. The Air Safety Institute has released a new accident case study that analyzes what went wrong after a Piper Lance took off uh, from an airport near Salt Lake City, Utah. They were bound for the Grand Canyon, uh, but that July 25th, 2020 flight ended in tragedy. The accident case study takes a look at a bunch of different factors surrounding the accident, including operations and high-density altitudes. As the pilot of Cherokee November 7677 Charlie experienced, high-density altitude robs an airplane of power, thrust, lift, and flight control effectiveness. 
The thinner air results in longer takeoff and landing distances and causes degraded climb performance that results in shallow climb gradients. The airplane was within weight and balance limits and near gross weight, but the pilot could not seem to replicate performance numbers found in the pilot operating handbook. Perhaps it was technique, perhaps it was the difference between test parameters and a real-world operational situation. The flight took off from runway 16, putting it on an almost direct course with the destination. The winds out of the north were variable and close to a moderate breeze. In a high-density altitude takeoff at nearly maximum gross weight, such a tailwind would certainly contribute to an even longer takeoff roll and worse performance during the climbout. Did the pilot want to avoid the Class Bravo airspace above the airport and to the north? Or was he misguided by the initial ASOS report and didn't notice the wind direction had shifted from the south to the north before takeoff? The flight took off during the afternoon. Mountain flying guidance, especially at airports exposed to high-density altitude conditions, stresses taking off and landing in the early morning hours during cool temperatures that temper the ill effects of high-density altitude. In addition, it's essential to reduce weight as much as possible to help alleviate sluggish aircraft performance in high-density altitude conditions. High-density altitude and its effect on airplanes with normally aspirated engines is critical for us to understand. As this accident illustrates, significantly degraded aircraft performance can catch us off guard at precisely the most important time, during our takeoffs and landings. Performance data found in the Pilot Operating Handbook can also mislead us. This is why the AOPA Air Safety Institute recommends padding performance numbers by 50% to account for differences between the manufacturer's published numbers and what we can expect in actual operational conditions. You can watch the full accident case study on the Air Safety Institute's YouTube channel. Just click on the link in the upper right of your screen. Well, in industry news, the regional and major airlines are hiring like crazy. Aviation consultant Kit Darby talked to AOPA, and he said that the regionals have increased their annual salary from just 16000 a year in 2000, and it's 108000 a year now in 2023. But the major airlines are also upping their game. Their pay has been going up about 10% annually since 2010. They're also increasing their retirement compensation packages, and they're expected to hire 14,000 pilots this year. That would be a new record for the major airlines. While you're on our channel, here are a couple of videos that you're going to be sure to check out. We take you on a tour of the Western Antique Aeroplane and Automobile Museum. It's home to one of the largest collections of still flying aircraft and still driving automobiles in the country more than 315 combined in the museum. And we talked to the first owner of an opener black fly. That's a personal electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. And it's pretty incredible to watch it take off and land. Well, we'll drop links to those videos down in the description below. And finally this week, we bring you the story of a New York high school that is doing great things with the AOPA Foundation's You Can Fly Aviation STEM High School curriculum. Gregorio Luperon High School for Science and Mathematics in Manhattan, Spanish Harlem, was founded in 1994 to serve Spanish-speaking students who are new to the United States. They use AOPA's You Can Fly high school program to teach students about aviation and encourage them to pursue careers in the field. Programs in aviation and robotics expand the school's offerings in science, technology, engineering, and math. A group of 90 students take part in the AOPA You Can Fly program. There are Redbird simulators, including a helicopter, and students gather in groups to flight plan and make weight and balance calculations. Gregorio Luperon was the second school in the nation to use the AOPA program, and it is in great part because of math and science teacher Jonas de Leon. A pilot since 1993, DeLeon realized he had a responsibility to share his passion. The leadership here is a leadership that, um, that give us 
lot of space to bring to the school what we are passionate about and what we know about. And I provided all the evidence that there was a great need and that we, if we did not move in that direction, we were not giving our students all the options. The aviation class meets daily and the students can return after school and on Saturdays to practice flying the simulators. The hands-on activities give them a chance to compete to their fullest potential. It is a school for newly arrived immigrants, a student that have been in the country for three years or less, and we have been in existence for about 25 plus years, and they have been tremendously successful at addressing the needs of the newly arrived um, immigrants. What great work you all are doing there in New York with our curriculum. Well, I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Fly with AOPA. Be sure to like and subscribe to stay up to date with all our latest information. This week, we leave you with some beautiful footage from our very own AOPA senior video producer, Josh Cochran. And it's uh, taking off from Isla Grande Airport in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Be sure to send in your favorite flying videos at the link in the description. You just might see them on an upcoming show. And as always, if you're not already an AOPA pilot, we'd love for you to join us. Just click the link at the end of the video to learn more about our trial membership.